conference, let me begin my remarks by echoing the words of my friend and cabinet colleague Bob Ainsworth in paying tribute to our British Armed Forces. I have travelled to Afghanistan as recently as this summer and I have seen for myself their courage, their dedication, their professionalism and yes, their sacrifice. They do us proud and conference they deserve all our thanks. Now, conference, I considered coming to this rostrum and giving you a speech about the proud record of achievement in the field of international development over the last 12 years of Labour government. And I am extraordinarily proud of what together we have achieved on that journey. But today I want to do something different. I want to start instead by sharing with you a conversation that I had in southern Ethiopia. I was at a World Food Programme feeding centre funded in part by the taxpayers of the United Kingdom. And I asked a gentleman who was standing there in a queue waiting to receive his weekly allocation of food. I said, tell me what life is like for you here in this village. And with great dignity through his translator, he replied, in this village we work hard, we eat little, but we want our children to do better than ourselves conference, that answer, the extraordinary eloquence of that answer, spoke not just to his common humanity, but the common aspirations that link us with people in distant lands. <laughs> the conference, that answer reminded me of something else. It reminded me of why each and every one of us gathered in this hall joined the Labour Party. Because at the most fundamental root level, we joined the Labour Party because we believe in the equal worth of every human being. We recognise that there are values far beyond the language of contracts of markets and of exchange. Values like solidarity, values like care, concern and cooperation. Those are the values that we as a Labour Party hold in esteem. But we, thanks to our proud tradition, of internationalism have also always understood that those values don't stop at our national border and wherever there is injustice that needs to be rectified poverty that needs to be tackled the Labour Party will never walk by on the other side <laughs> and conference that is why today when our television screens are filled with the horror of both a tsunami and an earthquake in the Pacific, I can assure you this Labour Party, this Labour government, stands ready to act to support the people of Indonesia. <laughs> but conference, let us be honest with each other, there are other questions that are being asked of us at this time. I know that many of us have travelled here from communities across the country where the dominant question is how do I hold on to my job? How do I hold on to my house? And I recognize that for so many of our constituents, the cost of heating their homes, the cost of buying their weekly shopping, the cost of filling their car with petrol, the cost of getting a mortgage has gone up in the last couple of years. But let's pause for a minute and just reflect upon what unites those discrete but related challenges of food, of fuel, and of finance. Certainly on the centre left, we understand each one represents market failure. But there is another lesson for us, I believe. It is that no British government, being truthful with the people of Britain, could actually respond adequately to any of those crises by turning inwards and not recognising the need to work together to find shared solutions to shared problems. That is the lesson of the April summit that the G20 held here in London. But I also need to be honest with you, Conference, if the threat here in the United Kingdom is to people's livelihoods, the effect of the fuel and the food and the financial crisis in the developing world is threatening people's very lives. The best estimate, the recently published report of the World Bank, suggests that up to 100 million more of our fellow citizens on this planet are now being pushed into lives lived in extreme poverty that means a life lived on less than $1.25 a day. So when the threat of global poverty is not falling but rising, 
the Labour Party doesn't step back, we step up to the fight to together make poverty history. <laughs> Conference, it was the great South African Archbishop, Desmond Tutu, who once wrote, a promise made to the poor is a sacred thing. And that is why I am so proud that from this very stage on Tuesday afternoon, our leader, our Prime Minister, Gordon Brown, declared we will keep our promises to the world's poorest people and we shall enshrine that promise in the laws of our country. And why does that promise matter quite so much? Because each month, each year, I have the great privilege of seeing the difference that a rising aid budget from the United Kingdom is making in countries right around the world. I have the great privilege of meeting some of the 100,000 teachers who last year we trained to give every child the chance of a primary education. I have met some of the seven million families benefiting from having been given an anti-malaria bed net thanks to the decisions of this Labour Party and this government. Lives that will be transformed. And conference, I have held in my arms some of the three million babies who last year we inoculated from preventable diseases because of the policies, the priorities, and yes, the principles of this Labour Party. But, conference, there is something else that we need to tell the cynics. That aid is working and it is making a difference. The proportion of the world's population, despite population lives, rise, now living in lives of extreme poverty is not rising, it has fallen in recent decades. The proportion of the world's population in extreme poverty used to be one third. Now it is down to one quarter. So we are making a difference. But I equally have to tell you that all of that progress that we have made over recent decades is at risk. It is at risk because unless now we recognize the threat of dangerous climate change, then it risks undoing all of the progress that we have made in pursuit of the Millennium Development Goals these last nine years. If I have learned one thing as the International Development Secretary over the last couple of years, and I have learned a great deal, it is this. We still have a tendency here in Britain to talk about climate change as a future threat. The reality in the developing world is it is a lived reality. It is a contemporary crisis. And one of the saddest and cruelest ironies about climate change is that those very people, those very countries with the least responsibility for the present level of emissions are being hit first and are being hit hardest. Just last month, I travelled with Ed Miliband, our climate change secretary, to Bangladesh. We travelled there for two reasons. Firstly, to send a clear and unequivocal message that the British government recognises that meeting the challenge of poverty reduction and meeting the challenge of dangerous climate change are now indivisible challenges. But we also travelled there to see for ourselves communities affected on the very front line of dangerous climate change. There we met families living on exposed sandbanks in Bangladesh who told us that as a result of the glaciers melting in the Himalayas, the floodwaters are now rising, which puts at risk not just their livelihoods, but their very lives. For those families that on your behalf, Ed and I met last month, the coming six weeks are not a window of negotiating opportunity. They are a window of necessity, and that is why we need to get a deal in Copenhagen. <laughs> Conference, the possibility of that deal in Copenhagen alone should be a sufficient answer to those cynics who say, there are no great causes left. There's nothing worth fighting for. There are no great choices left in British politics. Conference, I tell you in all candor and in all honesty, there is no real cross-party consensus on international development in this country. For there is a world of difference between a political party that would simply rebadge the aid budget as climate finance and a political party that on Tuesday said we will enshrine our promises in the laws of this country. <laughs> Conference, there is also the world of difference 
between a political party that sees the Department for International Development as simply a vehicle to export its failed ideology, an ideology of assisted places, an ideology of vouchers, an ideology of forced privatisation, and this party, our party, the Labour Party, that is today using British taxpayers' money to provide strong public services in the developing world that will abolish user fees and will provide health services not on the ability to pay, but on the basis of need. <laughs> and conference, this is the world of difference between a political party where 96% of its candidates in the coming general election says that the aid budget should not be protected and a party that again chose and resolved this week to lead the world by legislating for our 0.7 commitment. <laughs> but conference, we don't need to look in the crystal ball when we can read the history books. There is the world of difference between a political party which, when in office, halved, yes, halved the British aid budget, and this party, our party, the Labour Party, who by next year, since 1997, will have trebled the aid budget of the United Kingdom. <laughs> Conference, it was on a cold February morning, some years back, that I had the greatest privilege to, for the first time in my life, hear Nelson Mandela speak. And on that morning, when he addressed a vast crowd in Trafalgar Square, he offered a statement that I recall here today. He said, sometimes it falls to a generation to be great. And let's be honest, that's one of the choices that we all face in the coming months. What do we want as a generation to be remembered by history for having achieved? Certainly, we will be remembered for the fall of the Berlin Wall. Probably, as surely, we'll be remembered for the rise of the internet. But what else do we want to be remembered for as a generation? Why can't we be the generation that is remembered for delivering the first fair, effective, and ambitious climate deal in human history? Why can't we be the generation that says we're going to make sure every child anywhere in the world has the chance of an education? Why can't we be the generation that says we are going to end the scourge and shame of preventable diseases like diarrhea and malaria that are today still killing innocent children the length and breadth of the country? Conference. The question is the same as it has always been. It is not a question of whether we have the knowledge or whether we have the skills or the know-how. We have those. The question is this. Do we have the political will to act? I assure you, this Labour Party, this Labour government, does understand this moment in history. We have the will and we will act. So conference, there are big choices ahead of us in the coming months. We have a battle on our hands and we know it. But I believe we should leave this conference united in our common purpose, strong in our resolve, and determined that over the months ahead, we will win this election, not just to build a better Britain, but to build a better and fairer world.